Hi, this is Dan Kirsch, VP and Principal Analyst at Hurwitz & Associates, and you're joining us at Trilogy Tech Talk, TechStream Live. I'm here with a couple folks from the Wombat Security team, Trevor and Amy. So why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Sure, I'm Trevor Hawthorne, I'm the Chief Technology Officer with Wombat. Great. My name's Amy Baker, I'm the Vice President of Marketing. All right, so we're here at the RSA conference. Obviously, you guys are involved with security, but what exactly does Wombat do? Wombat offers security um, training for end users for employees, so we help organizations teach their end users how to avoid cyber attacks. Okay, so it's in the phishing space, phishing front page of the Wall Street Journal these days. So what exactly makes you guys different? How do you do the training? Is it a, do you guys have a, is it just training? Is there a tech, tech part of it? Do you guys have technology? Go, you want to talk about training? I can talk sure, about Sure, absolutely. I would say, really, what's interesting about, you mentioned phishing, but what's interesting about this is we have a holistic solution because there are lots of things that lead to a successful phishing attack, and sometimes there are things that are not obviously phishing, so safe social networking, things like that. So our solution is holistic in that it assesses knowledge and educates, reinforces that behavior, and then we get to measure with specifics on how people are performing and where they should be improving. All right, interesting. Yeah, and, and so there, there's some, some really interesting things happening in our space now. Um, you know, the, the industry has responded to security issues and, and to risk traditionally through purely technology solutions. And I think what a lot of people are, are realizing is as those technology solutions have become more effective and better and, you know, they, it basically they've done a, a, a really good job at eliminating a lot of risk, but it's also kind of push the attacker to go after the end user more. And so, uh, you know, just like- So who's that end user? Is that just, you know, Joe in accounting or? Sure, and, and that's a, a really common question is, well, who are the bad guys going after? Well, really, it's just about anyone because what the, one of the things that the attacker wants to do is to just get a foothold onto something behind the firewall. You know, I just need to get something beyond all those technology solutions that, that my target has deployed. So it could be anybody from you know admin all the way up to you know C levels. Okay. So what do, what do you guys see as well? I guess the first question is when you have a customer, how do how do you guys start engaging with them? How how does the process work? Sure. Well, at least from to talk about phishing a little bit more. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we always recommend is that a customer develop that initial baseline. So you understand, okay. you know, where are we basically starting from? Um, you know, and then once you figure that out, you know, it's, you, the customer goes into the ongoing program. Um, so is that baseline based on, you know, your employees and, and their knowledge on phishing and their ability to spot maybe a malicious email? Yeah, that's actually a really important part of it. So we recommend two different baseline okay. assessments. One of them would be a knowledge-based assessment where you might ask questions across a broad uh, list of cybersecurity topics. And then the one that's really very powerful from a behavior changing perspective is a mock attack. So we offer mock attacks for phishing for SMS text messages and for USBs. So that particular element where you realize you might be susceptible to an attack, that wake up call that someone gets when they fall for an attack is the part that really kickstarts the program, so to speak. So we do recommend that that vulnerability assessment is one of the first things that you do in addition to the knowledge base, because those are specific threat vectors that it's great to get that baseline, but it's good to have the broad as well to understand the other areas that need help. So that's usually where we recommend people start is those two different assessments together to help them decide, okay, where do I, where do I go next from, next from an education perspective? All right, and you guys, you guys are describing the offering as a program. So it's not just, it doesn't seem to me like it's a one-time Absolutely. come in, train our employees. How, so how does the program work? I would say that even as, uh, as much as a few years ago, people were still doing that sort of one and done approach. And I think in the recent times, people are starting to understand exactly how ineffective that is. And they're starting to do something much more continuous. So once a month, they might get an assessment, a mock phishing attack or education and or an educational training module or something that actually reinforces and helps them understand exactly how to behave. Where we see things fall apart as if people are doing some sort of assessment and never really giving people the tools to understand how to protect themselves so they're not getting education, they really can't improve. Yeah. And then from the technical aspect, you know, obviously one of the greatest ways people get phishing attacks is through email still. Mm -hmm. So do you guys have any integration points with email platforms? Sure, so we have a couple different things. Um, so, and you're absolutely right. Phishing still, I mean, at, 
at the end of the day, if I need to get malware as the attacker from my machine onto my target, email is the number one way. Right. And so uh, one of the things that, that we developed is an, an Outlook plugin, and we're also developing it for a couple other different email platforms, but basically what that allows the end user to do is they can use our, our alarm product to basically whenever an email comes in, uh, they can use that, that, that Outlook button to really streamline the, the like email threat reporting process. If it's a Wombat originated email, you get a great metric that allows you to, to show, look, not only are, are people not clicking on, on, on phishing emails, but they're now reporting them to us. If it's not a Wombat originated email, uh, we do some analysis on it and send it over to the, to the security people within the customer so they can do some very quick an analysis on it. And so customers love it. You know, the, the end users don't have to really think. They just you know, click on it and fire it off. They don't, know, they, don't, they don't have to figure out who do I call or what do I do. It's really easy. And then the obvious question is, what happens if it's a legitimate email and someone presses that button? Sure. Um, so the 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 customer is able able to to provide feedback to the end user. You know, well, there was nothing wrong with that. That was a legit message. You know, so. All right. Interesting. So you guys must have a ton of data on the emails. You have so much visibility. Mm -hmm. So what? So you know, one interesting aspect is, you know, I treat my mobile phone totally different than my work computer. Mm -hmm. So it's it's got personal stuff. It's got work stuff. I'm checking emails in the back of a, of a taxi or on an airplane. How do you guys see mobile as changing sort of the way that uh, phishing attacks are performed or the way that users um, might be more susceptible to clicking on a link or downloading some sort of attached file? Sure, and, and so to, to talk about the data that, that we have, we have an immense amount of, of data, so we're able to to really understand what makes users tick, you know whether you know they fall for phishing or for uh, like social media oriented fish or it's consumer oriented fish or technical fish, um, and then we're also able to gather a pretty wide array of very interesting technical data. And when you have the amount of data that we have, we're able to do some really interesting things. Um, and so to answer the question about mobile. Um, so we have seen a huge increase in, or an explosion really of the amount of, of our emails and of, and of our training content that is consumed on mobile devices. Yeah. And uh, what we also see is that we, we typically see slightly higher click rates on mobile devices because you know, we, you're, you're in the back of a cab or you're walking down the, down the street, you may not be paying 100% attention. It's, it's a multitask kind of tool. Right. So uh, you know it's a little bit harder. Obviously, you can't hover your mouse over. You have to do some things differently on 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 mobile devices. Um, but but back to the data, that's where you know I kind of hinted earlier that there's some really interesting things happening in the in the space. You know, Amy was talking about the need to kind of make this a continual program. You can't do just a one shot deal. We call that marathon practice. Yeah, and you kind of got to keep doing it. And you know, I I kind of relate it back to you you don't just patch servers one time. You have to continually maintain them. And so users, as we're finding out, it's the exact same way. Yeah. And so what, what the data allows us to do is that we're basically able allowed to identify who the most vulnerable users are, the users that are most susceptible to phishing attacks or who are deficient in like other key areas, social media, wireless, mobile security, because again, this is part of the suite of, of, of training that, that, that we offer. And so, Customers have, have, have come to us and they've said, can you tell me who my like, riskiest users are? Now, we're able to gather that through a couple different means. We're able to gather that through every interaction we have with an individual user as part of our assessments and part of the mock attacks that Amy was mentioning. But we're also able to gather a large amount of like technical data. Um, we're also, we just recently launched some technical like what kind of technical data? Sure. So uh, obviously, like where where did they click from? What IP address did they click from? Browser browser version, uh, various plugin types. So if you look at a lot of phishing attacks and you look at the postmortem, what the bad guys are basically doing is exploiting things like Flash, Acrobat, Java, QuickTime, those types of commonly exploited plugins. We actually pull back all of that information and build it into that user's profile. So if you have an individual that has a knack for clicking on emails that they shouldn't, um, and they're doing it with technology that could be exploited by the attacker, you kind of want to identify those individuals first and give them really prescriptive and really targeted training to patch those users. Um, customers are interested in it, or they're interested in this type of like uh, user risk management data because they want to treat those customers differently from a training aspect. 
but then they also want to consume that data out of our system so they can have other technical applications for that. So, you know, if I could give a customer, here's a like stacked ranking of your users from riskiest to least riskiest, some customers, they want to take that top 10 percentile and put that into their blue cut, put that into their various security platforms okay. in order to do things differently. Interesting. So one thing I see is RSA grows year after year. There's more and more vendors. At this point, there must be hundreds of vendors. And CISOs I talk to are overwhelmed with the number of security vendors that they have. So why, why should they, you know, they might have great malware protection, great antivirus, they've got a firewall, they have a SIM. Why, why add you guys to the mix? What I would say, that, so I've been doing security for 20 years now, and uh, the industry has grown, obviously RSA, everybody loves, you know, <laughs> this place is huge, it's massive. Right. The, the technology it continues to improve, but users are still a really key part of this, and I think that's what the enterprise is starting to, to realize is, at, at the end of the day, if the attacker can have a malicious call to action, if they can ask the user to perform something that subverts a security control, that is up to the user. The other thing is, so as, as, as more and more people are, are moving stuff out to the cloud, from an attacker standpoint, would I go up against Microsoft, Google, Amazon, a lot of the cloud providers, or would I just go after the guy who has the credentials to get into the right. cloud service? So, so what, what have you guys, been doing over the last six months to really improve improve um, the platform. I know that you guys have done some developments. Um. Yeah, so a lot of really interesting things. You'd asked a little bit about integrating with other technologies, and I'd love to have Trevor talk a little bit more about education triggers, okay. which is something that we're working with a partner, Carbon Black, on. Where we're actually using the technology that exists today that people have already installed in their environment to monitor end user behavior, and then if somebody's having a risky behavior and doing something risky, we can actually trigger just-in-time training for them. And so uh, those are that's an ecosystem and an environment that Trevor probably wants to elaborate on, but that really does streamline it. It actually gets to a point where not only are you running -act proactive programs, you can actually be reactive to people who are doing something very risky at the moment that they're doing. So that would be someone you know, clicking on something they shouldn't have or doing some other action, and immediately they're told, you shouldn't do that, and this is why? Mm. Yeah. Right, so if, if you, if, like, so we talked about the data and how, that, how we're able to drive a really interesting user risk scoring model based on the data that, that Wombat natively collects. When you start integrating in other security technologies, whether it be web filtering gateways, endpoint protection, there's a lot of data that comes out of those technologies that you can use to kind of glean how risky a given user is. A good example and, and something that, that is in beta now is we're, we're able to consume carbon black data. So carbon okay. black is an endpoint protection technology that basically sends very detailed telemetry, really, from every single user's endpoint. So why don't you explain that a little bit more for people who aren't you know, knee deep in security. Sure, so you know, everybody has antivirus deployed. Most people have antivirus deployed onto their workstations and, and onto all of their, their endpoints. And what, what we realized is, is that we kind of need something like a network flight recorder or a black box to basically watch everything that is going on on an endpoint. Okay. And so a lot of those technologies... So that's everything from a phone or an iPad to a laptop. Yeah, and it depends on the particular ven vendor solution. But basically, Carbon Black, it, it will send you, and a lot of, the, a lot of these, these solutions, it, it will send to a centralized collection point the, the DNS names, the URLs, the files that are being accessed, the processes, like tons of data about the endpoint. And based on that data, we, Wombat, were able to kind of glean and cherry pick out certain events that are indicators of risky behavior. Okay, so a great example is, you can see that like outlook.exe is the parent process. So you can see that, that Outlook spawned iExplore.exe. So it's obvious that the user clicked on something in their email and it spawned yeah. a browser process and you couple that together with the other behavioral data that, that we talked about. So if we say that we have an, an individual user who they f are pretty good at falling for the phishing attacks, coupled with the fact that they click on a lot of things out of their email, you probably need to have some pretty prescriptive training to that individual. And so all of these technologies that, that we're integrating with allows you to sort of focus your like 
risk lens a little bit more and to get improved resolution out of uh, you know what your user population looks like. So it sounds to me, and, and correct me if I'm <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, that you know attackers are constantly evolving. And so they were they were going after web apps, mobile apps. Mm -hmm. There's solutions now, a long list of them to address all of those. Mm -hmm. And now you know one thing that hackers are doing is saying, gee, you know it, it's tough to do a web app. But there's good DevOps mm -hmm. uh, processes where they do app scanning. Mm -hmm. And almost the weakest link now are employees. Is that, sure. is that right? Is that what you guys see? Absolutely. Yeah. And it, that's really, I think, come up in the last year or two mm -hmm. where we've seen just explosive demand for a security education program that can address that really holistically. And we're seeing more people build it into their whole entire security environment as an integral part of how they defend themselves. And so how do you guys get you know, the average employee who, do, who really doesn't know about hacking, who still thinks hackers are just kids in hoodies, not, you know, an organized criminal group. How do you get someone to really realize that they're part of a, their enterprise security um, team, even though that they might be in accounting or HR or something like that? So that, most companies now are trying to create a security culture where they understand that each person is responsible for helping to secure the, the, the organization as a whole and it's not just the security department that's responsible for that. One of the best ways to do that is the mock attack discussion we had earlier where that's the part where the person understands, wow, I can do something that could actually harm the company. Most people I don't think really understand that until they get that mock attack that says, yeah. hey, there isn't a firewall that's going to prevent all of these things. There aren't other defenses that prevent everything. So we can't always be there watching you as an individual help to protect us as well. And the more that that becomes part of the organization's culture to understand that everybody has a part to play, the better experience everyone has and, and the better defenses they have. Okay, so it's really, it's really a two-pronged approach. You have Trevor's talking about the technology aspect, but then this training is a huge part of it. It is, absolutely. And what I love about it is the training transcends the office. Everything that we're teaching people, they can, t they can bring home with them. It's all directly applicable. And we often get requests from people who have taken training saying, my mother, brother, grandfather, <laughs> daughter would really need this too, and what can you do for me? And we sell to organizations today, but a lot of people have asked for that because they enjoy it, they get a lot out of it, and they want to pass that knowledge along to their employees, their friends, their family. And so briefly, we, we talk, we've spent a lot of time on emails because that's you know, the typical way that attackers are... Um, attempting to get into organizations now, but you mentioned USB sticks, social media. What, how are those being used and, and what are you guys doing from a training aspect? Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of different ways where you know, people can make mistakes. And one of the kind of common themes that, that we want to follow or that, we, that is in all of our content is basically we want the user to make good decisions whenever their job or whenever their life really intersects with security. All right, so, so that it's, it's almost like a muscle memory built in. And so things like, you know, not plugging in USBs that you find laying around or, you know, not oversharing on social media. So, yeah, a lot of things that, that you just mentioned. All right, great. So this is really interesting. You guys are sure going to be busy on the uh, showroom floor. Yep. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Um, so I'm Dan Kirsch with Hurwitz & Associates. I'm here with Amy and Trevor. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.